it matters whether the problem with emotions like um, anger or, in general, lack of tranquility, uh, whether, whether we conceive of that as disrupting our ability to assent to true propositions or whatever, or whether we need to think of this as going the other direction causally, that it has something to do with how we're thinking about propositions that affects whether we have emotions or not. Now, why, why is that an important thing? Why, why was I dwelling on that point at length? It seems like such a, such a minor detail of the theory. Right? I mean, why, why did we keep, keep, why did I keep coming back to that point and sort of obnoxiously saying, no, you're wrong, you've got it exactly backwards, which, which you were a very good sport about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I, think I, I think I know from subsequent discussion with you that you understand the reason, but I'm wondering if other people clued into what we were talking about. Because it's a rather fundamental point about the Stoic theory of, of emotion. Why would it matter which which direction we were talking about. Uh, okay, Alex. It's kind of the key difference between Epicureanism and, and Stoic philosophy. Because one of them is the end for one, and the other is the end for the other. So depending on how you look at that situation, you would be going towards a Stoic end or an Epicurean end. Well, I don't, I, I don't follow you. How I look at it, how, how is it Epicurean? What does it have to do with Epicurean? It was in the discussion between... We didn't, in, in, we didn't actually talk about Epicureanism in that discussion at all, I don't think. Oh, uh, maybe I'm thinking of a different one. Right, the question is why... Let's try to be as exact as possible. There was a claim that the problem with having emotional states is it means that we become irrational and don't ascend to the true proposition so we can't live in accordance with nature. And I said, well, that, that, that sounds good. That all sounds like stoic slogans, like living in accordance with nature and controlling emotions and so forth. But the, the model actually goes in a different causal direction, opposite of that. That it has to do with not assenting to the right propositions, producing emotion. Now, why is it relevant which direction that goes in? Why, why, does that, why does that matter, and why do I insist on that? Yeah, because I think we're talking about that the essential exposition by living in accordance with nature was simply a byproduct of living in accordance with nature. You don't pursue having the right attitude and propositions. That's simply the byproduct of pursuing being a function of nature. So it's, therefore it's not, it's causal, but it's not the intent, I think is what we're trying to get at last time. Um, well, uh, so whether I assent to the propositions is a byproduct of the emotional state that I have. From, is that what you just, yes, yes. I think that's what you yes. just said. So then in, in, in your view, this is sort of similar to what Daniel said, it goes like this, I have an emotional state uh, like anger, and then I have these propositions. It would be good to have examples of what we mean. But if I'm in that emotional state, then I end up asserting, uh, assenting to false propositions, and that's bad because I need to assault, uh, 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 I need to affirm true propositions in order to live in accordance with nature. Okay, so let's say that the proposition is somebody insults you and you're angry. Right? So therefore, <coughs> well, look, why don't you actually give an example of a proposition? Right? Okay. So that, that's, you know, a sentence or something. You, you gave an example of an action. Somebody insults you. But we need something like, um, somebody insulted me, and that's a bad thing. Or it's bad that I was insulted. So a proposition is an attitude based on some, something else in the world? Is the proposition like a virtue? Uh, the, uh, uh, well, proposition in general is is uh, just a sentence. It's just a predication of something of a subject. Okay, so it's a linguistic entity, 
And in the Stoic theory, it's a lecta. It's a sayable. It's a thing that's <coughs> said. But it's a really simple thing. It's a subject and a predicate. Okay, But certain subjects and predicates combined in certain ways, some of them are true and some of them are false. So if I say that it's raining right now, uh, and it's not raining, then that's false. If I say it is raining right now, uh, and, uh, and it is, then that's true. And why is it true? Because truth means saying of what is that it is, and falsehood is saying of what is that it is not. So a proposition isn't, isn't a spooky, scary, logical thing. It's just a sentence. Now, the relevant ones, as far as both virtue and emotion are concerned, are sentences about values, about things being good or bad. Okay? And, uh, and we seem to have a pretty plausible thing here, that we don't like anger, for example, because anger makes me uh, assent to false propositions like, I become angry because somebody insulted me, insulted my having shaved my beard as, as when I came in and, and you asked this mocking question of me, then I could have thought, this, this student is insulting me, and that's, uh, you know, because I, because I became angry, you know, and then I think this is a bad thing, and so consequently I uh, do something unjust like fail you in the <laughs> class, or refuse to accept your the, the revision of your paper, and so then I don't live in accordance with nature. And so that's why the Stoics don't like anger, because it makes us assent to false propositions, and when I assent to false propositions, I don't live in accordance with nature, that is, I'm not virtuous, so I'm not getting the end of life. Now, that sounds like a pretty plausible story to me, and it's using a lot of great phrases of Stoicism and of ancient philosophy. But it's actually not the theory. And if this was the theory, then the work we read last time on tranquility of the soul wouldn't make any sense. Like what he's saying to do and so forth would have no value and no worth and would be totally in vain. So <clears throat> that, it, 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 it's a nice, plausible sounding theory that somebody could defend. It's just not the theory we're talking about. Okay, so we need to understand the, the details of, you know, the philosophical account of how it works, how propositions relate to emotional states, how that relates to living in accordance with nature. Yeah? So I think if you're going this way, saying that our emotional states determine what propositions we ascend to, that kind of undermines, like, their whole view about um, what nature is and what wisdom is, because... Um, so they have the view of human nature, right? You have the like the human part of the soul and then the animal part, right? Or that God being like some. Wait, wait, I, I didn't hear that. You you you. Well, you have the, the rational leading part of the soul, right? Yeah. No, no, no but that's not actually. There, there aren't parts of the soul. Okay. That is the human soul. Is okay. the hegemonic soul. Okay. okay. So actually, that's pretty important. Is that you lapsed into a non-stoic psychological theory there, according to which there's parts of the soul. So, so parts of them could be rational, parts of them could be irrational, and then there's, a, there's an issue of trying to modulate the irrational one, like use reason to control the emotional state, but, or, or, or modulate it so it's just the right amount of emotion. And you're right, that's a peripatetic, uh, you know, Aristotelian account of emotion based on Platonic tripartite psychology, mm -hmm. okay? Now, the Stoics reject that view of the soul. Let's just start with that point. There aren't parts of the soul. But they, they did think that the leading part of reason determined what propositions we assent to. Right? Okay, good. Now, that's true, and that's on the path to understanding why they can't hold this model of emotion and why they need to hold a different one. Now, Luke, you've been very patient. So, uh, I, I keep avoiding eye contact with you, but go ahead and uh, <laughs> say your piece. No, I mean, if, if emotional states precede our ability to assent to rational propositions, and Seneca's exhortation to use the you know 
proposition or the virtues which are formal propositions to modulate our emotional states and achieve tranquility doesn't make any sense because we, if, if we're already pissed off, we can't ascend to the virtues which will let us, let us be less than pissed off. So it doesn't operate this whole mechanism. Exactly. So that is the key reason. Okay. So the, you've now got the psychology right that I've got this leading part of the soul and I need to think of myself as the one who has control of which propositions I assent to. Okay, and so it must be a matter of which propositions I assent to that produce the relevant emotional state. And the reason that's important is exactly as Luca just said, because the Stoics, in theory, have a cure for these diseases called emotions, these pathological affections or passions called emotions. They've got a therapy or a cure for them, a cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, what does that mean? It means we change the cognition. So we change this, this part of the equation. We change the part that has to do with which propositions are being assented to, and thereby change the emotional state and so the emotional state, Torin, is a byproduct of what propositions we assent to. You have exactly the backwards model that, that Daniel did, according to which which ones I assent to is just a byproduct of the emotional state. If that was the case, then there would be no point of attachment where Seneca's advice could do anything. I would have to be in an antecedent emotional state in order to make any use of his propositions, but then they would be worthless to me because I would already be in the emotional, the relevant emotional state. So uh, now there, there, there are theories of the emotions that go that direction. And so they work on trying to directly affect mood and emotion and that sort of thing. But, and, and that is the great promise, some people would say triumph, but I don't think we're there yet, but promise of things like pharmacological solutions to psychological problems. That maybe we can just directly modify the person's mood and emotional state, and then they won't, then they'll be able to reason more clearly, and so they'll see, for example, that their lives aren't so bad, and they'll assent to different propositions and, and, and accordingly won't, won't be as depressed or whatever. Or have, or have the same kind of anxiety. But, the, but insofar as there's a sort of psychotherapeutic solution where through talking and rationalizing and reasoning about things, we can produce different emotional states, we have to see the, the causal arrow going in a different direction here. Yes? So one thing I'm still confused about that and it going from propositions to emotional state is, doesn't that contradict the stoic point where it's not that removing um, distress and pain is the final end, it's that uh, virtue is supposed to be the final end, that's supposed to be the highest good. So if you're saying that prophecy... Well, but this isn't, this doesn't, this isn't a diagram of means and ends, right? Where, uh, means and ends are a matter of, of like what we're consciously doing, what we're, what we're pursuing. And we're actually talking about a different kind of causality here, not that kind of final causality about being motivated by goals and things happening in the future, but actually what what efficiently produces the other thing? Mm. Which, which one actually produces it? Now, uh, under any of these models that's to make sense, I mean, even the peripatetic one, the goal is to live in accordance with nature, okay? But they have a different concept of the value of emotions and they think that having the uh, Aristotle, for example, thinks that you should have the right amount of anger, right? You shouldn't. You don't try to eliminate or extirpate anger. You try to have the right amount of anger because um, you you there seems to be something wrong with you if you don't have anger in certain situations. Like suppose you witness some injustice or something. If you're not angry about that, something's wrong with your character, right? And so that's not the Stoic. View, but if you had a view like that, then you take the emotions as more primary to our agency, and you try to modulate them and so forth. Stoics don't try to modulate emotions; they try to get rid of them. 
Now, as, as some people are writing papers on, it's complicated because they not only try to extirpate them, but they try to, for example, developing self-control to feel emotions in the right way. Um, and there was another title that captured this. Emotions, extirpated and approved by Stoicism. Okay, so uh, there are these, there are these uh, positive emotional states, but they too are products of reasoning in a certain way. And so as, as crazy as this theory sounds, the idea is that you can reason your way to not just not suffering from bad emotions, but all the way to happiness and success in life. That's, that's what it's about, is just reasoning in the right way. And that you can always do that, and it's always within your power. Even if you're being tortured on a rack, you can still assent to the right things and not assent to the wrong things, and so live like, live like a god. Uh, so that's, it's, it's really crucial to understand the difference between those two, and not to just sort of you know, muddle the idea of emotions, propositions, living in accordance with nature together, but see what, you know, actually what the substance of the, of the theory is. But now, are there other comments, or just resting with the elbows on the table? Give, go ahead. Um, so, as I understand it, that you could have propositions that you believe to be true, or propositions that you kind of have knowledge of to be true, and so the ones that you believe to be true would kind of lead to states that are more irrational, like the, the passions or whatever that's all right. up, and then the propositions where you have knowledge of to be true would lead to the eupathia, um, yeah. yeah, where that's kind of the the rational side of Yes, where that's correct. You've got okay. the terminology correct. And that's because, of course, we can, it's only opinions that can lead to emotional states. And it's only knowledge that can lead to the good emotional states. Now, why do I say that it, that it could only be that? That we could only use the term opinions for one and only use the term knowledge for the other? Can anyone think of just that epistemological point? Let's just, just concentrate on that. Why is he using and insisting on that terminology? To me, opinion, knowledge, it's all the same, right? No, why, why is it that you couldn't have a case where knowledge produced the bad kind of emotion, but an opinion produced the right kind of emotion? Why does that not make any sense? Uh, Esther. Um, is it because truth is in accordance with nature? Yes, it's because... Um, if I am producing a bad emotion, then I am necessarily embracing a falsehood, right. having a false value statement. For example, that he insulted my beard and that was a really bad thing. And therefore I am hurt about it. Yes, and, there, and therefore I'm outraged and, and, and angry about it, right? And everyone's going to be made to suffer for this. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and that's false. So it obviously can't be knowledge. Because knowledge can't be false. Right. Knowledge can only be true, or else it's not knowledge. But opinion can certainly be false. And so if I have, then so it must be an opinion that I have. This proposition or this judgment. You know, that's another way to think of propositions. Judgments. We could just call them that. They're judging that A is B. Okay, that's what a proposition is. It's just a judgment that A is B. And A either could be B, in which case. And I could judge it that way, in which case it's true, or I could, a, a could not be B. And if I judge it that it is, then I'm assenting to something false. So I could certainly have an opinion that that malicious insult and so forth, um, I could have an opinion that it's bad. Right. I can't have knowledge of it because it's false, and, and, and knowledge can't be false. But opinions can be false. So if I assent to that, then I could suffer from this emotional state called anger. OK, so that's, that's very important. Now, Chester, you were raising your hand, too. No, I was just saying, like, it's Seneca's view, just like, there's a proposition that empty your emotions, that's the knowledge. So I, I'm sorry, could you say it again? So if there's a proposition that, like, empty your emotions, like, just get rid of all your emotions, it's just, is that the true knowledge? Well, um, what, tell, tell me this magical proposition that's going to get rid of all of my emotions. So there's 
So there is no knowledge? Isn't the optimal emotion state of stoic just empty of emotion? Yes. So if there's no proposition... Well, except, except as Muzi and some other people have pointed out, they, they do, though there's a lot of rhetoric about completely getting rid of emotions, there still are these approved emotions. But we, we, we don't even really call them emotions. So yes, let, let's say in general the, the goal is apathy which means apatheia, not suffering, not uh, experiencing these emotional states. That's the goal, yes, but it, it, it seemed to me that the question was, is there some proposition I can ascend to that's just going to allow me to immediately achieve this goal of apatheia, of not suffering from any emotions? No. Of course there can't just be one proposition for that. Okay, why, why can't there just be one proposition that would dispel us from this disease of, of, of emotions? Why couldn't it just be one proposition? That's the question. What, How, what, what is the minimum number of propositions that it would have to be? Let's, let's put the question that way. How many, what, it, ideally, what are the minimum number of propositions that would rid me of every emotion? Yeah, one per emotion. Okay, that, that's the very good. And so, how many kinds of emotion are there? Very many. Uh, no. I mean, uh, infinitely many? Maybe. Or maybe there's just one. But actually, I think there's a more definite answer. Four. Uh, didn't I give a handout that actually yeah, yeah, lays them all out? Yeah. Okay, so there's four, right? So, I would need at least to always be assenting to the true propositions in each of those four categories. Now, each of those divides into a number of subcategories. And that may be infinite. There may be infinite shades of, of different kinds of anger. There's hatred, there's anger, there's etc. right? And then maybe there's an infinite number of uh, continuous variations within that field of that emotion. But it, it all comes down to the same thing believing that something bad is present to me that isn't bad, right? Uh, and so, as long as I never assent to a proposition that has that form, and, and that that content gets built in, then I should never experience that emotional state. But that happens all the time, because not only do people insult my beard, they insult my threadbare clothes and the... and and uh, my um, uh, anger about students not returning books that I've loaned them, and every day there's constant sources of possible anger in me believing that bad things are happening that aren't actually bad. And so that's in maybe not infinite, but indefinite number of propositions, things that could anger me. Okay, so. Uh, but there is, a, there is a definite answer to that. We, if, if, it was, if it was really just there's an unlimited number and the four kinds that they give are just sort of examples, but there's an infinite number of emotions out there. Think about the consequences of that. If that was really infinite, then we could never pin down which true propositions would answer to those possible false propositions, and so we could never hope to ultimately control emotions through cognitive behavioral therapy. Because you can't traverse an infinite sequence of propositions. So that, that's a really scary thought. I mean, maybe it's true, but um, if so, then hopefully we're going to come up with some very good drugs to deal with anger. Uh, there are some pretty good ones, but they're not, they're not perfect by any stretch. Yeah. I mean, uh, couldn't human emotion be like on a, I guess, a limited spectrum? Kind of like, I mean, if you, like with human eyesight, there's technically an unlimited amount of frequencies. Yeah, and I think, I think something like that's their, their view. Yeah, because like we only have like a, well there's an unlimited amount of frequencies but, and colors, but we only have a limited <clears throat> spectrum. This, this obsession that they have with defining each emotion, so if you look at that handout I gave you, each one is not just a name of an emotion, it's a definition <clears throat> of what would cause that emotion. The reason they're obsessed with definitions is not just because they're like really pedantic people that you know try to try to act like walking dictionaries or something. It's because they're trying to define, that is to limit 
the scope of, of emotions. And if they couldn't do that, because there was an infinitely vast field and the mind was really that, uh, uh, you know, that extensive, um, and maybe it is, but if it was, then there'd be no hope of defining every single one. So there'd be no hope of figuring out uh, on a rational basis how to avoid it. And so, of course, that's a possibility, though. I mean, let's not all just convert to Stoicism. It might be that the reason why we're basically no farther along in treating depression and anxiety, much less fear of death and belief that life is short and things like that, maybe the reason we haven't been able to make any advancement over ancient philosophy about this is just because there is an infinite number of things. It is irrational. It is absurd. And we can't just define our way out of it and think about things differently and have different cognition of it. Or, um, I guess, just continuing with the comparison I made with color, it's like um, there's technically like an infinite amount of shades of red before it starts turning orange, but there's still like a set amount that we would still call red. Or like there's like on a spectrum of emotion, there's like probably many different kinds of anger, but we could still call it anger. Yes, and as I said, I think that's something like their, like their view. Yeah. Um, but we better hope that, you know, propositions are very definite things. They predicate one thing of another. So unless we've got really good fuzzy logic or something where we don't just need binary true-false statements, we're going to need very definite definitions of each thing along that spectrum. And I don't know how good our definitions are of the, the one millionth shade of red or whatever. As long as we can still define it as red, I guess we're we're okay, just like we need to be able to define anger even if we can't define every infinite subspecies of it. But I think maybe they shade into each other and it's not, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but maybe it is. Maybe it's like when I say it's not that big of a deal, you know, white, beige, whatever, just paint it however you want. That is, that is not how my partner would see the remodeling of our house. Okay, uh, so sometimes these things matter and sometimes they don't. Okay, so any other comments about that? I mean, I'm sorry to digress, but if, if we don't get this point, we're sort of missing the whole value of the theory. Yeah? Well, wasn't that one of Cicero's main criticisms of Stoicism, that they were creating all of these definitions to define things? And if you are defining these things that are going to be the solution to these issues, and you, you yourself are defining them, and isn't that kind of like a... Well, um, isn't that kind of what? Like, a, circular. like circular reasoning? Well, um, I don't think they would agree that it's circular. It would be circular if, um, I mean, we th th this could be a circular diagram if we thought propositions cause emotional states and then emotional states affect propositions, then that would be circular. They bite the bullet and say it's a unidirectional thing. Okay. Now, and so what was what was Cicero's criticism about Stoic definition mongering and and um, terminology and so forth? Because that w that isn't it. You're you're. It's good that you noticed that he was criticizing them on that score. But what was the criticism? Sam, I remember him saying that. Their terminology just wasn't better than the ancients, like uh, you know the old. I think he, I forget who he's talking about specifically. I think maybe Aristotle, but yes, yes, academic Aristotelian, you know, old-fashioned academic philosophy. He's basically saying that they just their terminologies weren't more useful. Yes, than they they created they created variations, unnecessary var variations of terms, talking about things like cataleptic fantasy, uh, you know, graspable impressions and sort of talking about just, you know, appearances or something, right? Uh, and he doesn't like that creating a massive technical vocabulary that nobody, that, that he doesn't really seem able to grasp and certainly not able to translate into Latin, that inferior language of philosophy. Um, so, uh, that is actually the complaint is that, is that the Stoics reinvent Terminology, but that's not specifically a criticism about their theory of emotions, because there they just do use the conventional terminology. So if you look at the terminology on the handout that I've that I've given out twice now, you'll see it's all the standard stuff about you know distress, pleasure, anger, things like that. Those aren't 
They didn't rename anger, right, and insist that you call it rage or something like that, or call it rage anger or something and create neologisms like they do in their physics and in their uh, epistemology. They just use absolutely standard terminology for these things. Because it's a diagnosis of what's happening, what people are complaining about. I get too angry. I have fears of this and that. And, and I have desires for, for such and such. So they couldn't very well come up with an obscure uh, vocabulary on an issue where they interface with the non, the people that aren't devoted to the school, but they could benefit from their therapy. Yeah. So the modern day equivalent of this is cognitive behavioral therapy. And I remember when last quarter I took a class, a college class, and somebody came in who actually is a practitioner. Um, he gives he gives CBT to patients, and the main focus of his kind of terminology was what we call the hexaflex. And what's important is that it sounds sorry a hexaflex. It sounds really you know yeah yeah. Um, I don't know superficial. I'm just I guess. trying to I'm just but trying the, to etymologize it. Yes, yeah, the, the point is that there is this kind of hexagon of emotions, the different um, destructive emotions that people have. It can make them like, stuck in Oh, things. I thought it was a, a, a square. Uh, <laughs> but go ahead. No, and so, and so the, their whole point is Apparently there's six it, instead of four. So yes, yeah. The, their only point was like, overlap. We have found new ones, yes, right? Yes, yes. Okay. But their point was well, not so much emotions, more that cognitive states. Okay. The six good. cognitive, good. The destructive cognitive states. Very and good. so there is a lot of overlap between a lot of them. The, he, he, um, he posited. And so therefore, in this modern kind of sense of so thought, it isn't probably defined by one emotion. It's kind of an overlap. And by acknowledging the overlap, you move on and just be able to treat the emotion and move on. You don't get so caught up in the definition of things. Um, well, uh, yes, then that's, that, that's more and more a departure from stoicism. If you don't get caught up in the definition, and you don't try to limit and figure out exactly what the proposition in this person's mind is. So I, I, I understand it a little bit differently that it, you actually do need to become conscious of what the thing is, but then but then counteract it with other other propositions. Um, so if I'm thinking that everybody's trying to insult me, I need to start thinking, no, they aren't. They're just uh, uh, you know they don't care. They care about their own lives. Or if they slight me or something, that's because they're having a hard day or something like that then I replace these false thoughts with true thoughts, and then, so I don't go off on the tangent of the false thought, and I certainly don't ruminate about it over and over again, thus producing the emotion. But it's, I, I, it, to me, it's not as promising of a solution to say, oh, well, just don't think about it anymore. Just move on. Don't think about that proposition. It's sort of like, don't think about an elephant in the room right now, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really work. Uh, I mean, if we could just stop thinking about things, no problem. But actually stopping thinking about things, stopping thinking, stopping this, this train of thought is, is, is almost impossible. It takes you, you know, years and years of dedicated devotion to studying meditation techniques in order to be able to, like, stop your mind from thinking for 30 seconds. You're constantly thinking, whether you like it or not. And the stoic idea is, so you better start getting that thinking in accordance with nature in the sense of the thinking is assenting to true propositions and then you'll be happy because of it um, if, if that thinking, which is more or less inevitable, almost impossible to stop, if it's filled with falsehoods, then you're going to be in this, uh, you're, you're going to be mentally ill, essentially, to varying degrees. Uh, and, and you're going to be foolish. So, um, so therefore, we have developed these techniques that have to do with getting to people to think about them differently.